Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Last night, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, as part of the first in a series of celebrations and events marking the inauguration of President-elect Barack Obama, President-elect Obama, a son of Illinois, like me, and a son of the state that brought Abraham Lincoln to the nation, stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and conjured up the history of that place for this country. I'll read to you a few of the words that he spoke last night. What gives me that hope is what I see when I look out across this mall. For in these monuments are chiseled those unlikely stories that affirm our unyielding faith, a faith that anything is possible in America. Rising before us stands a memorial to a man who led a small band of farmers and shopkeepers in revolution against the army of an empire, all for the sake of an idea. On the ground below is a tribute to a generation that withstood war and depression, men and women like my grandparents who toiled on bomber assembly lines and marched across Europe to free the world from tyranny's grasp. Directly in front of us is a pool that still reflects the dream of a king and the glory of a people who marched and bled so that their children might be judged by their character's content. And behind me, watching over the union he saved, sits the man who in so many ways made this day possible. It was a stirring moment in substance and symbol in our nation's history to think of the first African-American president addressing the nation on the steps of the memorial to Abraham Lincoln on the eve of the day of commemoration of the toils and blood and sweat and life of Martin Luther King. And it's in the spirit of that moment that we're happy today at a university named after George Washington, one of the people that President Obama was asking us to reflect upon, and Robert E. Lee, another person whose complex history and character also has shaped the lives of so many Americans. And to reflect upon all of this cascade of images on this very special and unusual and poignant and in many ways extraordinarily joyous Martin Luther King Day. To help us reflect on that, we're very, very pleased to have as our guest Hilary O. Shelton. Professor Speedy Rice, through his good offices, has arranged for Mr. Shelton to be with us. He has, for many years, been one of the nation's prominent advocates and activists and champions in the field of American civil rights. He is currently the head of the Bureau of the Civil Rights Organization that more than any other in our history has shaped the modern struggle for equality, the NAACP. In his current role, as we head into this important new juncture in American history, he'll be responsible for a vast portfolio of issues that are of concern to the NAACP and to civil rights activists around the country. These include such difficult issues as affirmative action, equal employment protection, access to quality education, gun violence, racial profiling, the death penalty, comprehensive health care, voting rights protection, and justice in our criminal justice system. He has been often honored by many different groups for his stalwart service to the country and to the cause of civil rights. His many honors include the Congressional Black Caucus's Chairman's Award, the National NAACP Medgar Evers Award for Excellence, an award that I suspect has special significance because I learned just recently that your family and the family of uh, Mr. Evers come from the same plantation in Mississippi, one that also 
touts as one of its part of its legacy the family of John McCain. <laughs> Uh, and other awards, like the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee's Excellence in Advocacy Award and the Religious Action Center's Civil Rights Leadership Award in honor of Martin Luther King, Jr. We're very, very happy to have you with us, Hillary. We thank you very much for making the trip from Washington during these extraordinary times to share your thoughts with us. And I now invite all of you uh, to welcome to the podium Hillary Schultz. Thank you so much, Dean, for that very, very generous introduction. I have to honestly say, as I, I, I sat over listening, I, I couldn't help but think of the, the woman that had been recently widowed. She sat on the front pew of her church. His friend and colleague, neighbor, and relative came by, each giving great accolades to her then deceased husband. She finally leaned over to her son sitting next to her and said, son, would you please get up and see what that is in that box that they are talking about? Because <laughs> Lord knows it ain't your daddy. But, but, but nonetheless, with that, please give the dean a big hand. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. I really appreciate it. Thank you. On behalf of our president and CEO, Mr. Benjamin Jealous, Ben is an extraordinary young man who happens to be a Rhodes Scholar, our youngest president in the history of the NAACP, 35 years of age. It's amazing what you can do if you've decided you want to make some change in our country. He's someone we're very, very proud of. Our chairman of our National Board of Directors, Mr. Julian Bond, that brings special recognition to you, as a matter of fact, Speedy, he said, make sure that I let you know that he was looking for you for something. He's going to put you to work doing something. You know how Julian is. Our 64-member National Board of Directors, our 38 state conferences, we have branches, however, in every state in the United States, but also branches in Italy, Germany, Korea, and Japan. To our seven regions, 2,200 membership units, 700 youth and college units, and over 500,000 card-carrying members. And I hope by the time I am done with this speech, we will have added whatever the number of people in here who are not members yet to our roles as well. So indeed, it is an honor, privilege, and it's quite frankly, it's kind of awe-inspiring to be here, especially as we think about what we're here to talk about. Not just because Speedy Rice is sitting out here, and I'm always intimidated when I talk to Speedy about anything. He seems to know so much about what's going on in the world and is extremely helpful to the NAACP, but because we're talking about Dr. King here, indeed that man who gave his life literally to try to advance the cause of civil rights and equal protection for all Americans. I have to honestly say, as I, they told me I was coming to the Washington Lee University School of Law, I said, well, what could they possibly want of me, Speedy? And Speedy said, just come on and we'll see what happens when you get here. So nonetheless, I do want to thank the dean and, of course, our associate dean, Dan Forth. I had an opportunity to spend some time with as well. Turns out we're almost homeboys, as a matter of fact, from the great state of Missouri and the city of St. Louis and that other Dan Forth family that we all use from time to time. We can talk about that offline. I, I mentioned Speedy Rice, who is, again, a good friend of the NAACP, particularly on our international agenda. The NAACP has been involved in the international community in the struggle for human rights in the United States and throughout the world, of course, since the very beginning of the United Nations. Those of you who haven't heard very much about W.E.B. Du Bois, but he was committed to a brand of Pan-Africanism and other issues that combine us and bring us all together across the world and believe it very well. The United Nations should be that tool and help craft and create it in California and then help bring it to New York, as a matter of fact. So it's amazing how all that has worked together. And to the other staff people who have had an opportunity to meet and sit down and visit with and break bread with, along with a few other students that I've also had the opportunity to sit down and visit with, it is indeed an honor for me to be here. But let me say first that as I was trying to figure out what to say to all this, these law school faculty members who are all so bright and brilliant in your own rights, and very well to these keen minds of law students that will challenge us on everything, I know you're living through that right now, faculty members, very well, what could I say to you that would help make a difference on Dr. King's birthday? I have to honestly say there's someone that I call from time to time at the NAACP to get answers to questions just like that. We see ourselves at the NAACP of those who don't know the culture within our organization, and every organization has a culture. As we're celebrating our 100th anniversary, this is the 100th anniversary of the NAACP, and I join you all to join us, not just in membership, but join us in celebration as we move to see an organization that has worked to instill and advance civil rights protections for all Americans. For those of you who also don't know, 
The NAACP is an organization that was founded by a small group of very courageous African Americans, white Americans, and Jewish Americans 100 years ago. They sat together in a small apartment in New York City in a group that looks very much like the group I'm looking at from, the podium, from this podium vantage point. And they, they decided at that time that as much as African Americans had been freed from slavery a little over 40 years prior to their sitting down, that indeed African Americans were still being hung from the big oak tree throughout the South. And they could not allow that to continue. So they began pushing and they could have very well sat back and enjoyed the privilege of their day. If you think about who those people were with Mary White Ovington and W.B. Du Bois and so many others, they were all people of privilege. W.B. Du Bois, as a matter of fact, was the first African American to get a Ph.D. from Harvard University. It got so good to him, he went back and got a couple more. So indeed, when we think about it in those terms in W.B. Du Bois' history and that they would sit down and take the time, they could have enjoyed themselves in New York, but took on the cause and the struggle for freedom for all, recognizing that if anyone was left out of the equation, freedom was very well threatened for the rest of us. And they agreed to that, and they met, and they planned, and here we are 100 years later with many advances and many victories, quite frankly, under our belts. So I thought about that. I reached out to my friend, Reverend Julius Caesar Hope. For those of you who don't know, again, we see ourselves as soldiers on the battlefield for civil rights for all Americans. And like any other soldiers, not only our bodies, our minds, our hearts, even our souls sometimes become weary. And with that, we seek some kind of understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And much like in the armed services that has chaplains, we too have chaplains in the NAACP. So I had about a three and a half hour drive from DC, had a few minutes to talk with Reverend Hope, but didn't catch up with him, quite frankly, until just a few minutes before we pulled into your parking lot. I got Reverend Hope on the phone. I said, Reverend, I'm going out here to talk to them about Dr. King. He said, that's great. Dr. King is one of my heroes. I said, I appreciate that, brother. What can I say to these young people at this law school? What can I say to the faculty that might help make a difference? Reverend Hope, being the very thoughtful, pastoral person that he is, said, Hillary, you know, whenever I'm preparing to give an important address, speech, or sermon, I read the text very carefully. I'm a praying man, so I pray to God, begin meditating on the issue in hopes that God can speak through me. I said, Reverend, I, I appreciate that, but I'm getting out of the car right now. <laughs> and the young woman they've sent to meet me is standing on the sidewalk. What can I say to these people hoping to make some difference? Now, Reverend Hope is one of these people that aspires to what we call the ABC principles of life. The ABC principles of life. No matter how daunting the task or challenging the goal ahead of us, we must always be cool. And with that in mind, he was being cool with me. And indeed, he said, well, Hillary, in his most pastoral voice, maybe this will help you. There's a story in the Old Testament about a man named Balaam. You see, Balaam took his donkey into the desert in hopes that he could hear the words of God speak to him in a place that's nice and quiet. I said, Reverend Hope, brother, I appreciate that great training you got at the Intertheological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia. But brother, the sister's here, and I got to go. And he said, very well. And I could tell I was getting on his last nerves. He cleared his throat, <clears throat> and he said it like this. He said, Hillary, he said, maybe if I put it this way, you'll understand. If God can speak through Balaam's donkey, he can certainly speak through you. <laughs> so indeed, here I am on Dr. King's birthday, and we'll see what happens. As we think about a commemoration where a man is the greatest Dr. King, the question is, how do indeed we celebrate? How do we commemorate such a great man? So I called on Andrew Young. You know, Reverend, Mayor, Congressman, Ambassador Andrew Young. It just so happens that I happen to be married to his baby girl. So he does make himself available to me when I call. And I appreciated that. And I told him that I was coming, and I said, what do I say to people? How do we celebrate Dr. King's birthday? And he said, well, Hillary, I think that a celebration or a commemoration should be done in a manner that's consistent with how a person lived. If you have someone who likes to party, then a party makes sense. As a matter of fact, he went on to say that I'm from New Orleans. When I die, I want a second line at my funeral. So very well, when people party in the streets, for those who haven't seen the second line at the funeral in New Orleans, it's quite something. You celebrate the life as you do that. If you have somebody who's very serious, you celebrate in a very serious and somber way. If you have somebody that lived differently, that's how you celebrate. That's how you commemorate. 
I said, I appreciate that. I said, but what should we do? He said, well, maybe this story will help you. He said, you know, on the last King birthday we celebrated, we were actually working on the Poor People's Campaign. We were planning on a new march on Washington to take poor people to Washington, D.C., the Capitol. We were going to pitch tents and prepare to demonstrate that poverty is one of the major challenges in our society, and race has become nothing much more than a ruse that covers up the real issues of class and caste in our society that still very well live with us. So we were planning on finding ways to demonstrate. So we were sitting in Martin's basement in Atlanta, Georgia. At about noon, Coretta and the other wives and children and husbands, for that matter, came down into the basement. They brought a big birthday cake with candles lit. They sang happy birthday, and he blew out the candles. There was a lot of laughter and storytelling and fun and choking and whatnot, and we ate the cake. We celebrated a little more. They took all the empty plates and the children upstairs, and we continued to work. Indeed, he saw Dr. King's birthday as very well a day on and not a day off. A day we recommit ourselves to the struggle to make sure that our society becomes everything that we want it to be. And that very well Dr. King saw it that way and continued to work along those lines, even on his birthday. So I'm convinced we're in a protracted struggle to address the challenges of our day. Uh, when most people think about Dr. King, they think about those prophetic words on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. For those of you who saw the big concert yesterday with Barack Obama, there was a lot of uh, intervert, intersecting uh, Dr. King's speech. And of course, today it's all over the radio. I have a dream, it's being played everywhere. So I thought about that, I thought about that hot August day in 1963, where many people of all races and hues and colors and points of national origin all marched on Washington. I remember Japanese businessmen, I would look like Japanese businessmen, in their wool suits because they thought that it was such an august occasion. They would not dress down. They wore their suits buttoned up. And if you've seen those old pictures, I hope you'll go to the Library of Congress at some point and look at the NAACP's archive. It is extraordinary to see the kind of people who joined us all at that march. So I thought about that. I thought about Dr. King's speech. I thought about those prophetic words about us being judged by the content of our character and, and not just the, the color of our skin. In many ways, words that were repeated by Barack Obama even just yesterday. But I'm convinced that his most compelling speech that challenges us today, quite frankly, is a speech he gave in 1967 on that April day, on April 4th, at the Riverside Baptist Church to a, a group of clergy and lady concerned at that time about the war in Vietnam. The words of those speech that resonates with me even today and applies to the struggles, in my opinion, that we're having even now around war and poverty and other issues, well, let me just read you a part of it. It says, it seemed that there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched programs eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor, so long as adventures like Iraq, I'm sorry, so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and attack it as such. We can only stop this madness, I'm convinced, if we learn yet again to stand up and walk together to address these concerns and share a common vision for an America and in these days a world that's reflective of our values, reflective of our concerns in our society. So I was trying to figure out again, how do we take on these issues? I'm the government affairs director for the NAACP. My job is to walk through the halls of Congress. I meet with all kinds of Congress people and senators all the time, those who support us and those who don't. I've sat down with the likes of Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond. And I have to say those are very uncomfortable meetings in many ways for me, but meetings that needed to happen nonetheless. And even then, as much as there was much for us to disagree over, we could usually find something that we could work together on. Even as I do their report card, and I continue to do the NAACP's report card on how members of Congress vote on the bread and butter legislative agenda of the NAACP, neither of them ever scored an absolute zero with us. They got something right along the way. And so with that, being able to reach out and talk and discuss was always extremely important to me, and I continue to do that. So I reached out then to my friend Nancy Pelosi. Not to be a name dropper, but Nancy Pelosi is another first. 
She's the first woman to serve as Speaker of the House of Representatives, and that is arguably the most one of the most powerful positions on Capitol Hill and in our government. She is in line to the presidency. So very well, I'm happy to know that, and I, I want to share with you that she's also a lifetime member of the NAACP. And she reminds me of that every time we sit down to talk. I'll ask her for something, and she'll say, well, Hillary, now you know I'm a lifetime member, and blah, blah, blah. I said, Nancy, I appreciate that, but here's what we need you to do. <laughs> So very well, I went to her and I said, well, Nancy, maybe I don't understand. Maybe I've gotten some of this wrong. Maybe it's not the role of government, quite frankly, to be involved in these issues. Maybe the government should be more agnostic to these kind of values and whatnot. Maybe I have it wrong. And she looked at me as if I was crazy, quite frankly, because we've been knowing each other for some years. And she said, Hillary, how can the government not be involved in issues of social justice? How can we not be involved in issues of human rights? I said, well, well, what do you mean? What, what compels you to say that? And she said, well, look, every day across America, millions upon millions of children put their hands over their heart, they look to a flag, and they say the Pledge of Allegiance. And I said, Nancy, I appreciate that too, but what, what do you mean? And she said, standing, and I want you to picture this, standing in the rotunda of the Capitol building. I'm there talking to her, her office is right off the rotunda, as a matter of fact. And she's, she starts reciting the Pledge of Allegiance right there. I was almost embarrassed, but I, I found it fascinating. She began saying, well, the, the words go like this. She said, every day we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. She then went on to observe that this was as much a prayer as it was a patriotic declaration. That indeed, until every American, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, or other differences, are able to equally enjoy the fruits of this promise, this pledge, that indeed we are being sacrilegious as a nation and not living up to our creed. I found that to be fascinating. So I then went on to say, well, you know, that, that's helpful. It's helpful in thinking about things along those lines. But again, how do we move to celebrate Dr. King's birthday? So I've got some old friends in the civil rights community. So I reached out to Martin Luther King III, Dr. King's eldest son. And I asked him the same question. I asked Ambassador Young. Indeed, how do we celebrate your daddy's birthday, in essence? And he said, Hillary, you can't celebrate my daddy's birthday yet. You can only commemorate. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, let me put it like this. As long as over 47 million Americans have no health care insurance and the disparities are across racial and ethnic lines, we can only commemorate. We cannot celebrate. Until we address the issue of racial profiling in our society in which African Americans or others because of their appearance have stopped driving down our nation's highways and byways or trying to get through an airport are able to find themselves subjected to that kind of treatment, until we work out the racial and ethnic profiling issue across our country, we can only commemorate. Until we address the issue of education disparities in which all of our children are able to graduate at a rate consistent with our representation in society and make sure that indeed we have equal opportunity to go on beyond the 12th grade into great universities like this one, knowing that in this day and age the only way we can truly be successful is to have a great educational background, an important educational foundation. Until we do that, we can only commemorate. Until we take on the issue of the disparities in the death penalty and recognize that we have 38 percent of all those who were sentenced to death and later free because they were found innocent being African Americans make up only a little over 14 percent of the national population. And the only number more outraged than that is that 35 percent of all those that were sentenced to death and executed before they were found to be innocent were very well African Americans as well, almost three times the representation in the overall society. We can only commemorate. Until we take on the disparities in our, criminal, in our juvenile justice system, nothing more than a pipeline to our adult prison system. Until we recognize that African American children make up about 15% of the population, commit about 15% of the crimes, end up being arraigned to stand trial 20% of the time. They make up 50% of those that are going to be waived into the adult courts. And 70% of all the children that are in uh, uh, juvenile facilities today, we can only commemorate. Until we take on the issue of making sure that it's great to increase the minimum wage, we've got to work to make sure that hardworking people are compensated for their work. But indeed, as long as the minimum wage still only allows a family of three to live about $3,000 below the poverty line, 
until we move that minimum wage to a living wage so they can actually live in grace and dignity and get paid for their hard work, we can only commemorate. Until we take on the issue of the health care disparities where African American children die at childbirth at a rate more consistent with a third world developing nation like even Iraq and Afghanistan, the most highly industrialized nation in the world, and African American women die of breast cancer 12 times the rate of white women. African American men die of prostate cancer at a rate that's 11 times higher than white men. Until we take on those disparities and make sure that everyone is treated fairly and we have a health care system that makes sure it extends health care protections and coverage to all Americans, we can only commemorate. Until we take on the issues, quite frankly, of the disparities in our economic systems that have locked people out and are now very well subjugating entire families. They were kicking people out by unscrupulous mortgage brokers that targeted African Americans and other racial and ethnic minorities, steering us into subprime loans with early payment penalties, forcing us to a position not recognizing the increase in those exploding arms in which the mortgage rate increased by 2% per year every two years and very well ended up dropping the escrow, meaning you had to assume your insurance and assume your, um, your taxes, in which we saw mortgage rates go from, uh, mortgage uh, payments go from $1,500 a month to $2,400 a month, indeed, until we take on those issues and actually put the American family first, we can only commemorate. So very well, as I thought about that and thought about the importance of focusing not in only on making sure that those on Main Street were protected, but quite frankly, the NAACP is Back Street we're concerned about as well. We're still hoping that our people can make it to Main Street. We've got to make sure we take care of all American people. So until all those issues are addressed, indeed, until the injustices are made right, we cannot commemorate, and we cannot celebrate, we can only commemorate. So brothers and sisters, as we sit here today, I'm looking forward to your questions. I think about what has to motivate us to be more actively engaged. I'm convinced that we've come a long way. We've been able to move our country to a point where things are getting better. And I think as much as our challenges are still with us, I think about the challenges of one of my friends. Now, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. We were talking about that just a little bit earlier as well. I knew a guy that also grew up in St. Louis. We competed over everything who got the highest scores in high school, who got into the most advanced placement courses, who got the most scholarship money to go to college, all those things. Every summer we would come home and we compete over that again. How many of you are familiar with the word playing the dozens? You know what that is? For well, those of you who don't know, it's something that's uniquely from the African American community. It's where we have fun talking about each other. And oftentimes, for some reason or another, the term your mama comes into play. <laughs> With that in mind, we often came home and after we finished playing the dozens, we whip out our report cards and show off who got the highest grades and whoever won got to do the nudging and you know, you, you got to step up on playing the dozens. After we'd gone off to college, he went off to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. I went off to Howard University. I don't know how you all feel about this. I'm convinced I beat him on that one as well. <laughs> Nonetheless, we can debate that after the speech. But one summer we came home, I noticed there was something different about Ronald. Ronald was standing a little taller, had this gleam in his eye, his chest was out. When he walked across the room, his feet didn't even appear to touch the ground. Very well, we got together, we played our little game, whatnot, whipped out our report cards, talked about our great conquests. You know, brothers can do a lot of lying in those circumstances, too. But when all that was over, I got around to ask him, what's going on with you? And it finally became clear. That sparkle in his eye, that chest out, that feet not touching the ground, things because my friend Ronald had fallen in love. Indeed, he finally realized in his own awkward way. You see, Ronald was very academically bright. He had something to be desired in the social acclimates, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Nonetheless, he made his way across the street and finally realized that across the street from Morehouse College is Spelman College. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, Morehouse is a predominantly African-American male school and Spelman is a predominantly African-American female school. He walked up on the yard at Spelman and some fine sister caught his eye. But only by the grace and the charity and a sister's heart did she fall for him as well. <laughs> Nonetheless, they did. They began making promises and commitments of love and family and staying together and spending their lives together. You know, the kind of things we hope for for all of ourselves and our friends and whatnot. Things that I think make our family strong. So Ronald, after he graduated, they got married. Three years later, they 
bought a house, a little small startup bungalow in a kind of one of those challenged communities, you know, working class folks, working hard and that kind of thing. And after about three more years, they had their first child. It was a boy. Thank God that boy looked like his mom. <laughs> three more years later, second child was born. It was another boy, and he was beautiful as well. Unfortunately, when the second child was being born, she experienced some problems, setbacks. Began a hemorrhage. The doctors tried to clamp things off and stop the bleed. They couldn't. She died, and he was heartbroken. But every time he looked at those babies, he saw his wife. And every time he saw his wife in their face, he fell in love with them, and he committed himself that, indeed, he knew that he was a single father living in the black community. But that wasn't an excuse to do less. It was a challenge to do more. He wanted to make sure not only would he be able to give them the things that he should give them as a father, but try to do everything he could do to make sure he gave them what their mama would have given them. So he worked very hard. He made sure they got fed in the morning and talked to them about their day. At the end of the, every day, he rushed home from work to cook them a good hot cooked meal, to go over their homework, to know who their friends are. He made sure they got to Boy Scout and Cub Scout meetings on Saturday afternoon and every Sunday morning. They sat in the balcony of the Antioch Baptist Church. But as this went on, we realized that a number of things happened. Ronald wasn't able to impress his boss by getting there early or working late. In essence, he ended up foregoing many promotions and raises in salary that I believe he should have gotten. But because he wasn't able to demonstrate it in that way, they kind of went right past him. His oldest son was 11. His baby was 8. They still lived in that marginal community. And one night, he sat down, and after he finished going over his 11-year-old's homework, he sent him around the corner to pick up a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk, as he'd so often done. He sat down with his 8-year-old to go over his homework and talk to him about his day and everything as well. As his 11-year-old headed out and around the corner, like so many other communities in our country, there was a, a little corner market corner market on the corner that sometimes rival drug gangs like get into fights over who could sell their drugs on that corner. And as such, they got into a cussing match, and the cussing turned into a fist fight, and the fist fight turned into guns being drawn and shots being fired. As Ronald's son stepped up on the curb, a bullet struck him in his chest, and he fell literally into the gutter. His blood and his life beginning to pour from his body. His father was summoned to his side in great desperation. He scooped his son into his arms, began pressing on the wound, trying to stop him from bleeding, trying to save his life. He could feel his son becoming more limp in his arms. He began praying to God and his deceased wife to please don't take him now. Indeed, I've worked to make sure they had everything they needed. I've put money away in a savings account. I've told them, you work hard, you get the grade. And I've got the tuition, but you've got to work hard and get the grade. And so he put his money away and made sure things worked out that way. And as that was happening, he could hear then the sirens swirling in the background, footsteps running up on his father, holding his 11-year-old son in his arms and pushing on his wound. He began thinking about all the things that had gone on and started rushing through his head, kind of his whole life and the things he'd done. What did I do wrong? Which things ended up this way. A reporter ran up to him, turned on the bright light of the TV camera, put a microphone in his face, and asked him, sir, what is it that you did wrong, that your son lay dying here on America's streets, just another victim of our war on drugs? What is it that you did wrong, that indeed your son is going to die? He couldn't believe anyone would ask him a question like that. So he choked back the tears for a minute. He wiped the tear away from his cheek. And he said, I didn't do anything wrong. I worked hard to make sure my sons had everything they needed. They're good boys. They were going to become great men and good husbands and fathers one day. I raised them to be good boys. Indeed, their future was very well in store. We had money for them to go to college, and I know they were going to do well. And the reporter then recanted, and said, then are you saying if you had it all to do over again, you would have done nothing different? He said, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I did everything that I should have done to make sure my sons were healthy and, and happy and committed and, and bright and ready to take on the world. But if I had it all to do over again, I would have done for the boy who pulled the trigger what I did for my sons. Ladies and gentlemen, even as we move into this great time, I'm convinced there's so much more that we have to do. You're going to gain, gain very much after the great degrees you're going to get at this university, and you're going to be allowed to isolate yourselves in many ways if you choose to do so. But I'll tell you this. You can't live in a community with a, a wall so high it can't climb over it. You can't live in a neighborhood and even dig a moat so deep it can't swim across it. And indeed, as we move throughout our society and our day with the great skills you're going to get, we need you engaged 
like never before. So as I'm thinking about what's going on today, I have to say getting back to Dr. King, I'm convinced we've come a long way. I'm convinced we've done an awful lot. I'm convinced that Dr. King reviews the dream and the images that he laid out for us, giving us a blueprint for a great America. Indeed, he'd have to say we haven't gotten there yet. We've moved well in the right direction. But I'm convinced on tomorrow, Dr. King will be standing on high, looking down low. And he'll say to himself, you know what? We haven't gotten there yet, but we've come a long way in America. So thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. <laughs> I'm going to give the dean back his pen, and I'll take as many questions as I'll let him. Yes, sir. Thank you. I would ask them why they are utilizing such misinformation to undercut one of the most successful programs in integrating our society in its history. That indeed in context, if you look at the history around the creation of affirmative action, we know it was because of an executive order by Richard Nixon opened the doors to eliminate the artificial obstacles to allow women to come to college to work. Indeed, we know that prior to 1972, women made up only one third of, um, of women in, in colleges and universities across the country. But six years later, they made up over 50%, and they continue to grow. Indeed, the artificial obstacles were there. We know that white women are the number one beneficiaries of affirmative action, and that's fine, because white women make up over 30% of the national population. So they've also been the largest victims of discrimination in our society in the areas of education, employment, and contracting. I want to find out that and find out what's wrong with the tool that allows uh, employers and contractors and universities to help make sure that we're providing a great opportunity for all Americans regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, and so forth. And indeed, what's wrong with it? And I'm convinced that very well you'll find, if they're being honest, and the biggest problem is that most, con most opposition to affirmative action are not honest. They want to suggest that affirmative action still requires quotas, and we know quotas were outlawed with the Bakke decision. And we can move on from there to see how those kind of approaches to affirmative action have been chiseled away at. If we think about affirmative action overall, it's been a very helpful tool for all Americans, and I believe that we're a greater country because of it. If the question is asked, at what point do we eliminate the need for affirmative action, I'd say the need would be eliminated when indeed we have that kind of parity across our country. But quite frankly, even if you left affirmative action programs in place after you've reached that level of parity, you wouldn't even notice it was there. It would be there only as a safeguard. It would be almost like keeping, the, the, keeping uh, the laws against killing other people on the books, at the same time working to make sure nobody kills anybody else. What's wrong with keeping it on the books, even if we never have to use it? Make sense? Amen. Any other questions for me? <laughs> yes, sir. See, first, there, there are so many areas that we need progress in, from, from broader issues of economics, ec access to economics, access to capital, and even fair treatment with that access to capital. Um, a criminal justice system becomes one of the most blaring problems, I would argue, that indeed we have a criminal justice system where we still selectively decide how we're going to prosecute people, and too often it's across racial lines, whether you seek a simple manslaughter charge or, um, or a death penalty charge for, for a particular crime. It's often dependent about, by the uh, race of somebody. There are a number of bills that we're working on that I hope you'll take a look at to begin to speak to some of the answers. One is there's something called the 
the uh, End Racial Profiling Act that addresses the issue of racial profiling on our nation's highways, byways, and through our airports. John Conyers on the House side, Russ Feingold on the Senate side have been great champions on that. As a matter of fact, Barack Obama was a big supporter of that bill, not only at the state level when we moved to Illinois to become one of the first anti-racial profiling states in the country, but has always been a co-sponsor of the bill in the Senate as well. Interestingly enough, along with his top contender for the Democratic nomination, Hillary Clinton. We talk about issues like access to economics. One of the sad things that happened during this economic debate over TARP, you know, the, the bailout program, was they began blaming community-based programs that helped make sure resources came into local communities, like CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act. Those were tools that opened doors to actually force banks to be responsible in how they were lending money in the first place. It wasn't increasing regs like that. It was decreasing regs that created the problem. We've got to take on those issues and make sure that economic opportunities are there for everyone. It makes good sense when we pass programs that provide opportunities for small business people to start small businesses or expand them. The number one employer in America, after all, is small business. So why indeed, I would ask, though it's been an, an eight-year Cold War for many of us on Capitol Hill, would an administration under the name of George Bush decide that they would send forth budgets? And you know how the budget process works send forth budgets from the White House, actually zeroing out programs like the SBA. It doesn't make any sense at the same time you're trying to build job opportunities for more Americans. Those are key issues for us. Economics, access to housing. One of the things we talked about before is economics, that is your investment in anything, something that's like your home, are some of the most strategically important investments you can make. Home ownership can very well determine whether you're able to educate your children. I don't know how many are aware of this, but how many of your parents, maybe I shouldn't ask this question, don't raise your hand. I'll just ask the question anyway. How many of your parents had to refinance the house to pay your tuition? The bottom line is they had a house to refinance to be able to pay your tuition. When it's time for them to retire, how many of them can be looking to the equity that they built in that house, that investment? The only, most, for most Americans, the only true wealth you have is the equity in your home. But how many of them are going to need to use that when it's time to retire? Home ownership can make the difference between living in swallow and poverty in the sunset years of your life or grace and dignity. So indeed, those issues we still have to take on. Again, I think we've come a long way. What I'm seeing in our society is what you all are doing with technology. Lord have mercy what you're doing with technology. You are fearless, and I appreciate that. I was excited on the day of the election. When Barack Obama won, it was as if the home team had won the pennant. People were out in the streets with their pom-poms, their tops open, their sunroofs. They were screaming going down the street. The first, on first sight, when you hear screaming in Washington, D.C., you kind of duck first. <laughs> but then as it turned around and realized those were not screams of anguish, they were screams of joy. The people were really excited. They felt that the voices of Americans had been heard. But indeed, what happened is, as I was going to do an interview, we passed the White House, and somehow or another, a bunch of your kindred spirits from George Washington University and others decided to almost serendipitously converge on the front of the White House, where 10,000 people end up going down there with not one flyer being passed out. Only thing I can assume it was the power of the text message. You know what I'm saying? 10,000 people there chanting and cheering and celebrating the change that was happening in America. And one of the things I don't want us to overlook, it's more of a sideline, but it's still truly an amazing thing. We're able to see the transition from power. And Speedy and I talk about this a lot when we're talking about African countries and other third world countries. The biggest problem is the transition of power from one group to another group, non-violently, almost seamlessly, as we move into, a new, into a, a new phase or a new chapter in our lives. I think all of that's just wonderful. But I, I thought it was beautiful to see that happen. The new technology is being utilized. Y'all coming out. We're still trying to catch up with you, by the way. But y'all coming out and screaming and celebrating. I thought it was very, very high spirited. Uh, there, there are a few chants about leave now that were a little bit different for me. I had to kind of weigh all that stuff out now. We can wait until January 20th for that, you know. But I thought, nonetheless, you were able to voice your, your, your opinions and get it out there in a very nonviolent way. So I thought that was great. But the number of issues and a number of approaches I think we had to take on. I love it when I'm that eloquent. Lord have mercy. No, I'm just kidding. Speedy. <laughs> um, do you feel that there should be a criminal investigation or some type of investigation of conduct of the Bush administration in the political process where it's healthier if we maybe make certain mistakes and then move 
I do. I, I do. I, I don't like to think of as much as, as criminal investigations, but unfortunately some of them do rise to the, the, the stage of being criminal. But I do believe a lot of mistakes were made under this administration. And I, if we're going to be fair about it, I think we have to talk about the extraordinary position they were in. No one had experienced anything close to September 11th since Pearl Harbor. So very well, that the move that they did and the unjust ways to strip away civil rights and civil liberties, I think was outrageous. And perhaps, hopefully, if we're going to go through this process, it won't just be out of, out of vengeance, but be also to find out what happened that we went wrong, that we started again rounding up people that didn't look like the folks we thought were American citizens, and actually even shipping them off the shores of the United States to someplace else. Not just Guantanamo Bay and Gitmo, but also the stories about them going to some uh, Middle Eastern countries that have no interest in, in uh, human rights and very well tortured many of those people for no reason at all. There's really no good reason to torture anybody, quite frankly. So I think we need that. I think in some ways because of the pain and the anguish that so many communities in our country, because of what we experience under this particular administration, we're going to have to work all that out. And I believe exposing it to the light again is one of the best ways to do it. So let me just thank you one more time and say this. In this building all the time, we engage in a lot of intellectual enterprises. And part of the challenge for those of us that are on the faculty and the administration is to impress upon the students that that's not much a life of, uh, in the law if it's entirely an intellectual enterprise. And that what we're really about is justice. And that involves things a lot deeper uh, than just the, the ability to analyze and reason. And that involves a sense of right and wrong, a sense of service, uh, and a sense of the history and traditions of the country and the values that we stand for. And your speech today inspired us to remember those things uh, in light of the memory of Dr. King and the hope that we all have going forward. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.